Right. Um. I uh. Right. To be perfectly honest, I'm not really sure what I'm doing. I I found this. It's the only one I found in the box that's blank. You know, I've never actually seen a tape recorder, like in real life. It's quite... Well, I'm not even sure I know how to use it. Except I do. Because I turned it on. I hit the button and now I'm talking to it. Like it's a person. Like I'm crazy, which I might be. God, I might be. I probably am. In fact, I hope I am. I hope. I was just dreaming it all up. Another sign of an overactive imagination, as Mum would say. Spending too much time with those books and not in the real world. And even if it was real... There's no reason for me to be talking to you. No, to this. It's a tape recorder, Beth. It's not a person. But I am. It feels right to to tell you. So I'm going to. I'm going to tell you what happened and then it'll be over. And I can go back to my life. I'm not great at this. The talking, the explaining, the storytelling, it's not really my thing. At least, not anymore. When I was a kid, it was easy, you know? I was always latching onto one thing or another, letting it consume my brain and then going on and on about it to whatever poor soul I could call it long enough into listening. My parents didn't let me use a computer until I was well into my teens. Something about making my nightmares worse. It was all bollocks, really. How would they know that if they never actually let me use one? But anyways, before that, I used to spend hours in the Wokingham Library touring the sections. Once, when I was 12, I read a book on oceanography. Vanished ocean, how Tethys reshaped the world. And spent a solid week scouring the corners of every bookshelf for anything I could find on ancient supercontinents or vanished fault lines before giving my report to the first unlucky and unsuspecting librarian who happened to be out in the open. <laughs> I never cared what the genre was. Non-fiction, mystery, fantasy, that was never important to me. I just loved the pursuit and the compelling joy of walking through a new world. It was like a secret between me and the writer, something that we knew that nobody else did. I always dreamed of being a writer too one day, but like I said, the storytelling part never actually came natural to me, no matter how many books I consumed. I suppose it must have been that lack of skill that bugged the people around me to no end. My father spent most of his time at work, and I didn't really get along with my brother or sister, but let's just say that my mum was never as enthusiastic about my new interests as I was. It wasn't her fault. I was deeply, deeply irritating. But to my credit, the minute I realised that, well, that's when I finally started to shut up. Thinking back, I... I think that's where it started. I'd always been afraid of pretty much anything and everything. I mean, horror was the one genre I'd never been able to read. But when I got old enough, I started to routinely feel a gripping terror bubbling up through my stomach, my chest shaking my limbs and rooting me to the spot whenever I spoke for more than a minute at a time. All this to say, a few years ago I graduated secondary school with absolutely no skill in writing, the one thing I actually enjoyed, and a lot of anxiety. And it seems inevitable that I would end up studying library sciences, doesn't it? It's practically what I've always done anyway, sorting and researching. And a future as a librarian with a couple of cats in a cosy cottage surrounded by books, well, there are worse things. Much worse. I moved into student housing right before my first term started at Oriel. I call it student housing, but it's not. Not technically. The actual dorms were a bit out of my price range, so when I saw an ad looking for flatmates in Cowley, only about a 20 minute bus ride from the college, it seemed meant to be. There were 10 of us living here all together to start. Uh, George moved into his boyfriend's place last year, leaving nine. Or oh, eight now, I suppose. It was a proper house, renovated a few years back, I think, but it was already thoroughly trashed by the time I showed up. It was one of those places that 
The minute you walk through the door, you can just feel the grime lurking between the worn couches and stained mattresses, that musty smell of overuse. I tried to ignore it, I did, but one Friday night, a couple weeks after I settled in, I'd waited till everyone had gone and walked to the closest shop to buy a blacklight. It went about as well as you'd expect. I spent that entire weekend scrubbing his house from top to bottom. I even cleaned Sam's room. It's not like I'm a germaphobe or anything. I just like to know where things have been. And if they're dirty again, well, at least I know it's just the slobbery of my friends rather than that of strangers. I, I didn't... I didn't touch the basement, though. I never said I did. <laughs> not sure why. It was always just... An unspoken agreement between us. I must have asked about it when I moved in. I must have. I mean, it would be one thing if it just never came up. It was just an unfinished and unsafe part of the house we didn't go down to and that was that. But, you know, thinking about it now, we, we didn't even mention it. Not once. It's amazing, isn't it? What you can ignore. Right up to the moment you're devoured by it. I don't remember the exact moment things started to feel wrong. It can't have been more than a couple of weeks ago. It was subtle, at first. Doors swinging closed on their own, misplaced items, shadows that didn't really fit. All things that can be chopped up to the mind playing tricks, out of boredom or fatigue, just a consequence of one too many sleeps and flights. I didn't really think about it too hard, even when Sam brought it up at breakfast, after insisting that the place was haunted. Well, that was easy to dismiss. She's always going on about some supernatural this or that, and I don't believe in ghosts, but even that would have been an easily digestible explanation. It was like that for a few days, and all the while that feeling of wrongness lurked in the background, pulsing beneath us. I honestly don't know if I would have even taken notice if Milton hadn't have started behaving the way he did. Milton is... was... Every bit the hipster film student of your wildest imaginations. <laughs> I swear, I saw him wear a beret once, completely unironically. And we did friends, as I was one of the few people who would listen to him ramble on about whatever hard house film had caught his attention that week. We got on fine, well, actually, for flatmates at least. That's not to say I always liked him. I'd acted in a few of his student films just by convenience, and he wasn't exactly the most easy to work with. Everything always had to be just the way he wanted it, down to the most minute detail. I swear, if he could have tied strings around our limbs and puppeted at us from afar, he would have. <laughs> Sorry, that's... That's poor taste. It had to do with the cassettes. You see, Milton had always insisted on using magnetic tape for his recordings, refusing to even entertain the idea of a digital camera. Something about being more authentic, I never understood it, but far be it from me to get in between a film major and the precious analogue charm. And he loved those tapes, and we all got used to seeing dozens scattered through the house at any one time, which is why it struck me as odd when, last week, they vanished entirely. And when I brought it up to him, he just said that he'd been editing a new project and he needed them. I wasn't sure what kind of project would require that many cassettes all at once, but he certainly spent enough time working on it. He'd been locked away in that room for hours, sounds of wearing machinery coming from behind his door. And when he did come out, he was exhausted. God. I tried talking to him about it, you know, but he just ignored me. Make up an excuse to leave or... Pretend he hadn't heard me altogether. Well, it was strange behaviour, sure, but not supernatural. Or perhaps I would have chalked it up to stress, just a bad week, but that's when the nightmares started. I had always had them. Just a side effect of my anxiety, but they died down a couple of years ago, after I moved to Oxford. One sleep after this started, though, I saw Milton. He was sat at the desk, a mess of cassettes unspooled into piles of thin, black, magnetic tape scattered across it. He was tangled in the tape as well, almost every limb bound by it. He stared at the pile in front of him with dull eyes, completely still. I didn't realise until the tape began to lift his arms that he wasn't just tangled in it. 
The long metallic strands were embedded directly into his skin. I watched as the strands controlling his every movement, he grabbed a spool and very slowly raised it to his mouth. His jaw unhinged farther than anything natural and he began to stuff the tape down his throat again and again and again until the entire pile was gone. I never felt relief the way I had when I finally woke up from that dream. I didn't know it was only the first time that I would have it. I awoke from one of these nightmares late one night, heart beating fast and body sticky with sweat. I climbed downstairs trying to clear my head and found Milton, sitting in the living room staring at our small television screen playing his movie. At least, that's what I assumed it was. There was no coherent, no audio, just rapid, violent black and white images that flashed across the screen sporadically and bits of static that faded in and out at random. Occasionally, I'd see the corrupted and disjointed image of my own face across the screen, along with the other actors. And the pattern was... hypnotic. Every few minutes, the images would perfectly align, shaping into spindly, bony legs that almost seemed to reach beyond the glass face into the house. After a while, I finally managed to ask him if he was alright, if the cassette had become corrupted somehow, if there was any way to fix it. He'd always been so fiercely protective of his tapes, and with the state of his in, I expected him to be furious or devastated, at least concerned. But when he turned, there was none of that written into his face. Just a calm, blank expression. He studied me carefully for a long moment before finally speaking. We should feed our guest. She's so happy to have arrived and she is very hungry. He smiled after he said that. And when he did, I could have sworn I saw that thin black film tape weaved inside him, webbed into the back of his throat and threaded right through the fleshy centre of his tongue. I went back upstairs immediately and locked my door, sat in bed, until the sun came up. I managed to avoid him the days after that. I thought about telling the others, trying to explain it to them, but I knew it wouldn't end well. They wouldn't believe me, why would they? I wasn't even sure that I believed me. I thought about moving out, of course I did, but I had nowhere to go. No money, no real friends outside of the ones I already lived with, and who knows if I was just overreacting, imagining it all. So, I just decided I'd ignore him as much as I could until he went back to normal or I saved up enough money for a new place. It didn't last, though. It was three days ago that it all happened. It was late, and I'd carelessly lost time sitting in the kitchen, studying for my history exam. I was alone when he walked in. He didn't say a word, just met my eyes with that calm look, like an invitation. Then he turned, with a finality I had never seen on him before, and opened the door to the basement, vanished down the stairs. I shouldn't have followed him. I could have just walked away, went upstairs and buried my head in my pillow, but I didn't. I had to know, to see. So I walked down those old stone steps, dodging cobwebs. I don't remember if I closed the door behind me or if it did that part on its own. The cellar was warm, far too warm for October. It was unfinished and empty, save for an old lidded cardboard box that sat neatly in the centre of the room. A long jagged crack ran through the floor and up into the far wall, as though the foundation had been damaged in an earthquake or something. And Milton stood facing away from me, towards the crack in the wall, whispering something I couldn't quite make out. I called out to him and he turned to face me, expression wild with 
something. Excitement? Panic? He started to say something before, all at once. Dozens of shadowy, spindly tendrils adorned with what looked like coarse hairs crept from the crack and began to wrap themselves around him. I felt that familiar terror bubble up, running cold through my veins, stronger than I'd ever felt it before. I wanted to run or scream, but I couldn't. He didn't scream either, but I could see the fear growing in his eyes, silently pleading. He didn't move, not even as the tendrils began to unspool him. They reached into him, breaking into his body like plaster and pulled. He was hoisted from the ground, his limbs yanked in different directions and elongated. They just dangled there, arms and legs and head only still attached by threads of dark magnetic tape like an old torn doll hanging together by string. And then the tendrils began to move him. They took their time puppeting him. And in the end, they pulled up his head, forcing his gaze to meet mine. His cheeks were strung up into a grin, but I saw the tears that flowed freely down his contorted face. I don't know how long I stood there, watching him stripped apart piece by piece, slowly and deliberately. I couldn't move, I couldn't speak. I felt hot tears roll down my cheeks, although I couldn't tell if they'd come from the terror of it all or simply because I no longer possessed the ability to blink. I watched and watched. When it was over, he was gone. I waited. I waited for them to take me. Part of me just relieved that I didn't have to watch anymore. I already shut my eyes tightly before I understood that I could. I felt my hands twitch, regaining the will, and when I finally opened my eyes again, I was alone. In that old, dank basement with nothing but that long, dark crack and at the centre of the floor. The cobweb-covered cardboard box, now open, and filled to the brim with tapes. I don't remember the rest of the night with any real clarity. I know I stood there for a while. I know at some point I calmly bent down, picked up the box, and walked it upstairs. I spent most of the last two days just staring at it. I've missed all my classes. Sam has come to see me a couple of times to ask how I am. And this morning she actually brought me a plate of spaghetti. <laughs> Imagine that. Spaghetti for breakfast. I do appreciate the thoughty, but if it makes no practical sense whatsoever, it must be an American thing. And she did mention that a man stopped by yesterday. A short, graying hair, lots of weird scars, asking about strange happenings in the house. And Sam told him about her hauntings, and apparently he had been less than impressed. He told her that he was sorry and that she should move out and then left without another word. <laughs> Creep. I finally got up the nerve to look into the box and it's pretty much what it says in the tin. Tapes and stationery. And cobwebs. <laughs> so many goddamn cobwebs. Nobody said anything about Milton. I expect in the next few days someone will notice he's gone. How do you explain something like that? I've been seeing it again though. My nightmares. My nightmares have been getting worse. I keep ending up back there. I just watch and watch and watch. And I can't turn away. Statement ends, I suppose. Uh, uh, st st
statement. I don't. I don't. I don't feel better. I really thought I would. I don't know why. Why in the world do I think that telling my stupid story to this thing would make me feel better? <laughs> the box is still sitting at the foot of my bed. I want to get rid of it. I do. So why don't I just toss it? It would be so easy just throw it out. But I... blank as well. I thought I'd sorted through them all, but I guess I missed one. <laughs> They're quite interesting, you know. I haven't played any of the tapes yet, but I glanced at a few of the written accounts. Some of them are so illegible I can't even read them, but others are compelling. They make me feel... Right? I'm scared, but I don't know how to explain it. I did some research on them. The ones I read, anyways. I say research, I mean some quick googling, a bit of asking around. They're not real. The Magnus Institute, that's the logo printed onto the stationery, isn't a real place. And as far as I can tell, these people... These people don't exist anywhere. I mean, I found a few names that match, but nobody who lines up to the descriptions, and when I reach out to them, they claim to know nothing about any of it. Oh, one of the people I called, Timothy Hodge, his name is, actually gave me the number of his psychiatrist. <laughs> so maybe it's fiction. A collection of short stories about fictional people and fictional suffering. Just a practical joke. Except, I know that it's not. Even barring what happened to Milton, I can't explain. I just know. I should probably move out. I'm the idiot would stay in this place after something like that. When I leave this room, I'm going to have to walk by that basement door. Every single day. I should leave. I want to leave. I will leave. Just not yet. I need to understand. To unravel the mystery. And I'm getting the feeling there is something in this box that will help me do just that. I'll try to recall whatever I find out. I do have another blank tape, after all. End recording. New Threads is a fan work based on the Magnus Archives, which is a podcast distributed by Rusty Quill and licensed under a Creative Commons non-attribution Sharalike 4.0 international license. This story is not affiliated with the official canon of the Magnus Archives podcast, is purely for creative purposes, and is not being monetized in any way. This episode was written, performed and produced by Bella Pritchett.